Jeff, you. welcome to Berlin. Thanks. It's great to be here. Hello, I everybody. have to tell you, when we were sitting in the first row just a couple of minutes ago, when the heartbeat uh, was there, Jeff looked at me and I was breathing in and out and he looked at me and asked, uh, Matthias, are you nervous? I said, yes, I'm always nervous on occasions like that. <laughs> then he said, so am I. And I said, really? <laughs> the richest man in the world is nervous because he received the Axel Springer Award? <laughs> so be uh, a bit forgiving. We are both nervous. Um, Jeff, we are so glad uh, to really celebrate you tonight. Uh, most importantly, apart from all the reasons uh, that we heard, um, because you are a role model for other young uh, founders, for entrepreneurs who really have great ideas, crazy ideas, unconventional ideas, and need encouragement to simply do it and go for it. And you have shown it to the world. So that is really, for me, the most important thing. And in that context, the first question, you used to work in New York as an investment banker. So an investment banker is actually the exact opposite of an <laughs> entrepreneur. He is delegating risks to other people. And basically, uh, how did you find out? Or how did you think that you should move from you know, investment I, banking to really launch a company? I, um, I think I'd always wanted to, to do it, even since I was a kid, um, had the idea. One of the people who every time I look at something, it looks like it could be improved. You know, there's something wrong with it. So I go through like, wow, how could this restaurant be better? How could, and you know, and so I've always had that kind of idea. By the way, before we really get into this, the, how about this amazing production that you and your team have put together? This is truly incredible for its originality. Like these boxes that you were filming live, that's just crazy cool. So thank Glad you. Glad you like it. Um, Glad that you like it. And truly, it's, it's incredible. But I think um, the great thing about uh, humans in general is we're always improving things. And so entrepreneurs um, uh, and inventors, uh, and you know, they follow their curiosity and they follow their passions and they figure something out and then they figure out how to make it better and they're never satisfied. Uh, and, and you need to harness that, in my view, you need to harness that energy uh, primarily on your customers instead of on your competitors. And so where I see, I sometimes see companies and even young s small startup companies, entrepreneurs go awry, is they start to pay more attention to their competition than they do to their customers. And I think that that, um, I think that in big mature industries, that can be, that might be a, a winning approach in some cases, kind of close following. Let other people be the pioneers and, you know, uh, and, and go down the blind alleys. Mm. There's many things that, that, that a new inventive company tries won't work. Um, and so those mistakes and errors and failures do cost real money. Um, and, and, and so maybe in a mature industry where growth rates are slow and change is very slow. But as you see in the world more and more, there aren't very many mature industries. Change is happening everywhere. You know, we see it in the automobile industry with self-driving cars. And, but you could go right down the line of every industry and you would see it. But where, do you have any idea where, where your ambition really uh, comes from? What, what was driving you? Um, I, I really don't know. Uh, you know, my, I've been passionate about certain things uh, forever. Um, and I fell in love with computers in fourth grade. I got very lucky. Um, my elementary school had a teletype that got connected to a mainframe computer that some business in downtown Houston donated a little bit of computer time to. And this is, you, you can picture these teletypes. They had the punch tape and they had a 300 baud modem. You would dial up the phone and put it in the cradle. And so we had some time sharing on that mainframe computer and none of the teachers knew how to use it. So me and two other kids stayed after school and sort of figured out how to do it and figured out and taught, kind of taught ourselves programming from books. I think one thing that is, um, it, I got very lucky early in my childhood. Look, we all get um, gifts. Uh, we get certain things in our life that are um, uh, that we're very lucky about. And one of the most powerful one is who your early role models are. You know, you could, they could it be your parents. It was your grand grandfather. It was yeah. in a big sense. My, my mom and dad, but my mm -hmm. grandfather too. And you know, I had my mom had me when she was. Uh, 17 years old, and she was still in high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
and this is in 1964, I can assure you that being a pregnant uh, teenager in high school was not cool in Albuquerque, New Mexico at that time. And uh, so, uh, it's, in, in, so it was a very, it was difficult for her. My grandfather went to bat for her when they tried to kick her out of school. And, you know, he, they're, they're incredible. I had, to, so the gift I had is I had this incredible family. Could you describe and, a little bit the role of your grandfather? Because sure, Sean has mentioned it. I think it was yeah, really important he, for it you. It was super important for me. And um, I spent an unusual amount of time with my uh, grandparents, and especially with my grandfather on the ranch. So he had a ranch in South Texas. And I would spend my summers there from age four to 16. And they, when I was four, they were taking me for the summer to kind of give my parents a break, you know, sort of because they were so young. Um, and it was useful. I was a handful, I'm sure. And, uh, and uh, anyway, he, 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 he created the illusion for me when I was four years old that I was helping him on the ranch which of course could not have been true, but I believed it. And, um, and then as, by the time I was 16, of course, I was actually helping on the ranch. I, you know, I, could, I can fix prolapsed cattle. I can, you know, we did all of our own veterinary work. Some of the cattle even survived. Um, <laughs> and uh, we fixed windmills and laid you know, water pipelines and built fences and barns and fixed, that, fixed the bulldozer that you guys talked about. And so, one of the things that's so interesting about that lifestyle and about my grandfather is he did everything himself. You know, he didn't call a vet if one of the animals was sick. He figured out what to do himself. And uh, so, what does it mean? No delegation. Being resourceful, I think, mm -hmm. is the you know that you can always you can't if there's a problem, there's a solution. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you as you mature and, and get into the business world and anything you do on a team, you very quickly realize that it's not about just your own resourcefulness, it's about mm. team resourcefulness and how does that work. And, um, but that attitude of my grandfather's Influenced was you. very, but he was full of wisdom. You, you, um, John mentioned the story about the words my grandfather gave to me at one point of it's, it's harder to be kind than clever. That story, the, the slightly longer version of that story, because this was really powerful wisdom, is that I made my grandmother burst into tears. And the way I did it was we were um, driving on a long road trip, and she was a chain smoker. And this was, I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old, so this was around 1974. And um, it was in a period of time where there were heavy radio advertisements, sort of anti-smoking radio advertisements trying to convince people to stop smoking. And one of the advertisements ha had this figure in it. It said something like, um, every puff of a cigarette takes so many minutes off of your life. I think it was two minutes, but I can't remember. Every puff of a cigarette. So I sat there in the back seat on this long car ride and calculated how many years <laughs> she had taken off of her life. <laughs> And in my 10-year-old mind, I had been extremely clever to do this. And so when I was finished with my arithmetic, I um, proudly announced to her how many years she had <laughs> taken off of her life. <laughs> and I got a reaction I did not expect um, with her bursting into tears. And so my grandfather stopped the car, and he uh, took me out of the car. And I had no idea what was about to happen, because uh, he had never said a crossword to me. And I thought, he might actually be angry with me, but he wasn't. He took me out, because so she, we had some privacy from her, and he said this, these incredible words. You're gonna, he said, you're gonna mm. figure out one day mm. that it's harder to be kind than clever. Than clever, wonderful. Uh, actually, you, your brother also plays an important role. You have a very good relationship. Yes, is it my, actually true my, that he's still a firefighter? He is, he's a volunteer firefighter in Scarsdale, New York. He's also the funniest person I know. When I'm with him, I'm just laughing continuously. First of all, I'm a good audience. I, you know, I, I have, I laugh uh, easily. But, but he he is um, really very very funny. And my sister too. We're all very close. And I have my mother uh, to thank for that uh, because she worked hard to make sure as we grew up that we stayed close together. And um, she takes all the grandkids for one week every summer so that me and my sister and our spouses can go on a trip together. So we end up spending a lot of time together. Mm -hmm. For me, the most moving image that we saw tonight is the one that John uh, showed where you and Mackenzie are 
preparing the table, the famous <laughs> table, which is very moving because it shows how he really started from the very scratch. I mean, uh, and also it illustrates symbolically that it was the, the, the launch of Amazon was really something that you did uh, together. Oh, uh, yeah, Could you describe sure. a little bit what Mackenzie's role was? Well, how first of all, um, Mackenzie, you know, she had married this stable guy working on Wall Street. And a year after we got married, I went to her and said, mm -hmm. I want to quit my job move across the country and start this uh, internet bookstore. And McKinsey, of course, like everybody that I explained this to, her first question was, what's the internet? Because nobody knew. This is 1994. And, um, but, but, she, but even before she could say, what's the internet, she said, great, let's go. Because she wanted to support it. And she knew that I had always had this passion for invention and, uh, and, and, and starting a company. And so, uh, again, I think, you know, Mackenzie is an example of this, um, but it, 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 I was talking about with my, my mom and uh, my dad, who's a Cuban immigrant, and you have, he came to the U.S. when he was 16 and refugee camp in the Everglades. They are, uh, they're so loving and supportive that when you have loving and supportive people in your life, like Mackenzie, my parents, my grandfather, my grandmother, you end up being able to take risk. Because I think it's one of those things, you know, it doesn't, um, you kind of know somebody's got your back. Um, and so it's just, an, I don't so even you think, think you're thinking about it logically. It's an emotional thing. So That's for really me. It's really interesting. You think that unconditional love, if you feel and experience unconditional love, it uh, I think it helps makes, you take risk in life. Take risk. And by the way, yeah. I think it's probably true of all kinds of risks in life, yeah. not just starting a business. I mean, yeah. life is full of different risks. And I think that the. When you think about the things that you will regret when you're 80, mm. they are almost always the things that you did not do. They are acts of omission. They're not, you're not, very rarely are you going to uh, regret something that you did and it failed and didn't mm. work or whatever. But the acts of omission, the thing, you know, and it's not, and again, I'm not just talking about business things. It's like, you know, uh, I loved that person and I never told them. Mm. And then, you know, 50 years later, you'd be like, why didn't I tell her? You know, why didn't I go after it? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of that's the kind of life regret that is very hard to uh, be happy about when you're telling yourself in a private moment that story of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's it's um, anyway. I have been I've been won that lottery. I won that lottery of having um, so many people in my life um, who gave have given me that uh, unconditional love and. And I do think, you know, Mackenzie's definitely one of those. And so we moved, and then Mackenzie, um, who has basically no uh, skill in this area at all, really, I mean, you're the least suited person for this. She did our accounting um, <laughs> for like the first year. Was it the first year? Yeah. Something like that. And um, she did it well. I mean, that's really, <laughs> that's what's amazing. My wife is a, is a novelist. She's won the American Book Award. Um, she, you know, uh, Toni Morrison, the Nobel Prize winning author, who was Mackenzie's <laughs> teacher at Princeton. So did she suggest then said, to do a book said store? Said on, Charlie, on the Charlie Rose show that Mackenzie, Toni Morrison, the Nobel Prize winner, said about Mackenzie that Mackenzie uh, was her best student ever. Um, and so anyway, she's, Mackenzie is a very talented novelist, but she is not an accountant. Um, <laughs> but she pulled it off. And then, you know, again, you know, just we all get done what we need to get done. Did she then suggest that you focus on book business at the beginning, being no, an author? No, no. I picked that was your books. idea? I picked books. It is true. You know, she's a big reader. I'm a big reader. But, the, but that's not why I picked books. I picked books because there were more items in the book category than any other category. Mm -hmm. And so you could build universal selection. There were 3 million in 1994 when I was... Uh, pulling this t idea together, the, the, the three million different books active and in print at any given time. And the largest physical bookstores only had about 150,000 different titles. And so I could see how you could make a bookstore online with universal selection. Every book ever printed, even the out-of-print ones, was the original vision for the company. And so that's why books. And when did you know that Amazon is going to be, some, going to be something I, way bigger than just a bookstore? Well, I knew that the books, strangely, because I was very prepared for this to take a really long time. I knew mm -hmm. that the books um, business was going to be successful in the first 30 days. Mm -hmm. I was shocked at how many books we sold. We were ill prepared. Um, you know, I had, we had all the 
we had only 10 people in the company at that time, and most of them were software engineers. Mm -hmm. And so everybody, including me and the software engineers, were all like packing boxes. We didn't even have packing tables. And down, we were on our hands and knees on a concrete floor packing the boxes. And at about you know, one or two in the morning, I said to one of my uh, software engineering colleagues, I said, um, you know, Paul, um, we, uh, this is killing my knees. We need to get knee pads. And Paul looked at me and he's like, Jeff, we need to get packing tables. <laughs> and and I, I was like, oh my God, that is such a good idea. The next day I bought packing tables and it doubled our productivity and probably oh, saved our backs and our knees too. But nevertheless, so, I mean, Amazon had serious crises. In 2002, oh, you went many. almost uh, bankrupt. So well, what I, went wrong I, and what I, did you learn we, from that? We had so many, there have been so many, um, we haven't had any existential crises, knock on wood. I, find, I don't want to jinx anything. Um, but we've had a lot of uh, kind of dramatic events. I remember um, there, early on, we only had 125 employees when Barnes & Noble, who, the big U United States bookseller, um, opened their online website to compete against us, barnesandnoble.com. We'd had about a two-year window. We opened in 95. They opened in 97. And at that time, all of the headlines, and the funniest were about how we were about to be destroyed by this much larger company. We had 125 employees and $60 million a year in annual sales, 60 million with an M. And that, uh, and Barnes & Noble at the time had 30,000 employees and about $3 billion in sales. So it, they were giant, we were tiny, and we had limited resources. And the, the headlines were um, very negative about Amazon. And the, the one that's most memor memorable was just Amazon.toast. <laughs> and, um, and so I called an all-hands meeting, in, which was not hard to do with just 125 people. And we got in a room, and because it was so um, scary for all of us, this idea that now we finally had a big competitor, that literally everybody's parents were calling and saying, you know, are you OK? Is the, you know, it's usually the moms um, calling and asking their children, are you going to be OK? So, and I said, look. You know, it, it's okay to be afraid, um, but don't be afraid of our competitors because they're never going to send us any money. Be afraid of our customers. And if we just stay focused on them, and, 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 and instead of obsessing over this big competitor that we just got, that we'll be fine. Um, and I really do believe that. I think that if you stay focused, then the more uh, drama there is and everything else, no matter what the drama is, whatever the external distraction is, the, the, what your, your response to it should be to double down on the customer, satisfying them, not just satisfying them, delighting them. Yeah. Today, Amazon uh, is employing uh, 566,000 people. You are probably the uh, biggest job creator of uh, recent times. At the same time, you are aggressively criticized by unions and by media for paying low wages, for inappropriate working conditions. How do you deal with these accusations? Well, first of all, when any criticism, our, my approach to criticism and what I teach and preach inside Amazon is when you're criticized, first look in a mirror mm -hmm. and decide, are your critics right? Mm -hmm. If they're right, change. Don't are resist. Right? No. But not in this case. But we've had critics be right before, and we've changed. We have we've we have made mistakes, um, and you know I can go I can go through a long list. The, probably the one of the early most painful ones. It's it's so stupid. It's hard to believe how we ever did it. But um, in the early on with the Kindle, maybe the first year of the Kindle or the second year of the Kindle, we had um, accidentally illegally sold. Um, for our given away, I guess, copies of the uh, famous novel 1984 because it had a complicated copyright history. It was in copyright in the US and not in the UK or something strange like this. So it was in the public domain, but only in certain geographies. And we had screwed that up. And the, 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 somehow, and this is, a, this is a kind of mistake that only a corporation can make. An individual can't make this mistake um, because somehow it's like it happens at the 
at the intersections of the different teams. So you've got the legal department saying, oh, crap, we've made this mistake, and, and you've got the books team. Anyway, the answer that, that, the, that the, the company came up with was to, without any notice or warning, just electronically go into everybody's Kindle who had downloaded that book and just disappear it. <laughs> so it would be as if we walked into your bedroom in the middle of the night, found your bookshelf, and just took that book away. And, um, and, so, it was a, and so we were rightly criticized for that, it was, uh, and, and, and we, we responded to that. On the, condition, on the issue of, um, of working conditions, I'm very proud of our working conditions, and I'm very proud of the wages that we pay. You know, in Germany, we employ 16,000 people. We pay at the high end of the range for uh, any comparable work. So is we it a union fight benefits. because the union want to make sure that you well, are unionized, or what, what is the I, real it, substance of the conflict? It's a good question. I, you know, and this is in my longer version of how to deal with critics, because there are two kinds of critics. Uh, there are well-meaning critics um, who, uh, you know, they, they're worried it's not going to work, but they do want it to work. And so it could be, I could give you an example, customer reviews would be one of those. Um, when we first did customer reviews 20 years ago, publishers were, some book publishers were not happy about it because some of them were negative. And so it was a very controversial practice at that time. But we thought it was right, and so we stuck to our guns and, 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 and had a deep keel on that and didn't, didn't, didn't change. Um, but uh, there's a second kind of critic, which is the self-interested critic. Mm. And they come in all shapes and sizes. You know, they're, um, so they can be any kind of institution competitors, um, of course. And so when you are doing something in a new way, and if customers embrace the new way, what's going to happen is incumbents who are practicing the older way are not going to like you. And they're going to be self-interested critics. And so you do need, as you're looking yourself in the mirror, to try and tease those two things apart. You know, in our view, you know, we, have very, we, have, we have workers' councils, of course, and we have very good communications with our employees. So we don't believe that we need a union to be an intermediary between us and our employees. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, it's always the employee's choice. And, th and that's how it should be. So we're, but, but for sure, we would be very naive to believe that we're not going to be criticized. I mean, that's just part of the terrain. You have to accept that. One uh, that I tell people is, if you're going to be, if you're going to do anything new or innovative, you have to be willing to be misunderstood. If you, cannot, if you can't afford to be misunderstood, then for goodness sake, don't do anything new or innovative. Maggie Thatcher said leadership is not to be pleased by the moment. Um, Perfect. But uh, your most prominent <laughs> critic at the moment is the President of the United States. Uh, people are even saying that he may be willing to prepare initiatives to break up Amazon because it's too big, it's too successful, it's too dominant in too many sectors, or for very other reasons. First of all, is this scenario of a break of something that you take seriously, or uh, you think it's just a fantasy? For me, again, this is one of those things where, you know, I focus on and ask our teams to focus on what we can control. And I expect, whether it's you know, the current US administration or any other uh, government agency anywhere in the world, Amazon is now a large corporation. And I expect us to be scrutinized. Mm -hmm. We should be scrutinized. I think all large institutions should be scrutinized and, and examined. It's, it's reasonable. And um, what's, you know, one thing to note about us is that we have, uh, we, have, we have gotten big in absolute terms only very recently. So we've always been growing fast in percentage terms. But in, in, in 2010, just eight years ago, we had 30,000 employees. So in the last eight years, we've gone from 30,000 employees to 560,000 employees. So for us, it's kind of, you know, in my mind, I'm still delivering the packages to the post office myself. You see what I'm saying? I still, I still have all the memories of, you know, hoping that one day we could afford a forklift. And so obviously that's my, my intellectual brain knows that's just not the case anymore. We have 560,000 employees all over the world. And, and I know, 
um, we should be scrutinized. And I think it's true of big government institutions should be scrutinized, big nonprofit institutions should be scrutinized, big universities should be scrutinized. It just makes sense. It's, it's a, and that's, by the way, why the work that the Washington Post and the other great newspapers around the world do is so important, because they're often the ones doing that initial scrutiny even before the government agencies do. But in a way, the general sentiment towards uh, the big uh, innovative tech companies uh, has changed. I mean, Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, they used to be seen as the nice guys in t-shirts that are saving the world, and now they are sometimes portrayed as the kind of uh, evil of the world. Um, and the debate about the big four or the big five, uh, the economist is uh, suggesting a split up. Uh, other uh, powerful people like Josh Soros are giving speeches in Davos. Um, the EU Commission is uh, taking pretty tough positions here. Do you think that there is a, a change in mindset in the society? And what should the, the big tech companies, what should Amazon learn from that or do with that? I, I think, I, I do sense, I mean, I think, again, I think it's a natural instinct. I think we humans, especially in the Western world and especially inside democracies, are wired to be uh, uh, skeptical and mindful of large institutions of any kind. We're skeptical, I'm sure, mm -hmm. we're skeptical of our government always in the United States, state governments, local governments. I assume it's similar in Germany. Uh, it's healthy. Um, because they're big, powerful institutions. You know, the, the police, the military, whatever it is. It doesn't mean that you don't trust them or that they're bad or evil or anything like that. They're just, they have, they have a lot of power and control, and so you want to inspect them. Maybe that's a better word. You, you kind of want to always be inspecting them. And I think if you look at the big tech companies, they have gotten large enough that, it, that they need, they're going to be inspected. And, and by the way, it's not personal. I think where some of the, you can go astray on this if you're the founder of a company, one of these big tech companies or any other big institution, if you, if you go astray on this, you might start to take it personally. Like, what, why, why are you inspecting me? Um, you know, and, and, and uh, I think that, you know, I, 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 I wish that, um, that people would just say yes. It's fine. The whole attitude towards uh, data protection and privacy yeah. has always been different between Europe and the United States, but is also at the moment, in the context of Cambridge Analytica, changing in the United yeah. States. Um, uh, what are the consequences for a company like Amazon? Um, I don't, you know, uh, my view on on this for, for Amazon. Is it his, his, hysterical or no, is it an appropriate? No, no I, yeah. honestly, I think this is one of the great questions of our age. You know, we Ooh. have, I think of the internet. So the internet is this big, new, powerful technology. It's horizontal, it affects every industry. And then if you think of even more broadly tech and machine learning and big data and all these, these kinds of things, these are big horizontal powerful technologies. And in my view, so we've been at scale. The internet is quite old at this point. It's been around a long time. But at scale, it's really only been around, you know, 10 or 15 years. It's so, it's, because, it, you know, go back in time, 20 years, it was tiny. And so at scale, the internet's been around only 10 or 15 years. And we haven't learned, as a civilization, as a human species, we haven't learned how to operate it yet. So we're still, we're, we as a, as a civilization are still figuring that out. And so it, it has fantastic, it gives us fantastic capabilities. I mean, you know, the fact that I can look up almost anything on Wikipedia in five seconds is an unbelievable capability that just simply didn't exist 20 years ago. And, and so on and so on and so on. There's so many good things. But we're also finding out that, that these powerful tools enable some very bad things, too, like uh, you know, letting uh, authoritarian governments interfere in free democratic elections around the world. This is an incredibly scary thing. So um, you're advocating a balance of, let's say, entrepreneurs who are really uh, moving their businesses forward, politicians and regulators who are defining a certain framework, uh, society, journalists who are asking unpleasant yeah, I mean, questions. So, my, my, so that's an ecosystem. My view on that Amazon's role in this, which is what you mm -hmm. asked me, is I think, first of all, we have a duty on behalf of, of, of society to try and help educate 
uh, any regulators, mm -hmm. you know, give them our point of view on this sincerely, without any cynicism or skepticism. This is what we believe. And then, um, but it's not ultimately our decision. So we will uh, we will work with any set of regulations that we're given. Ultimately, that society decides that. We will follow those rules regardless of the impact they have on our business. And we will find a new way, if need be, to delight customers. So we will always be, again, some of these things, what you have to worry about is the problem, uh, what I would not want to see happen is um, that uh, is you don't want to block invention and innovation. So that's always the, the, one of the things, one of the unintended consequences often of regulation is that it really favors the incumbents. Now, Amazon at this point is an incumbent, so maybe I should be happy about that, but, but I wouldn't be, because I think for society, you really want to see continued progress. You really want to see. So to the degree that we have regulation, you want to be sure that it is uh, incenting innovation and not blocking it while at the same time protecting it. But data security, privacy, um, encryption, you know, how do you, uh, uh, how do you safeguard people's physical safety mm -hmm. against terrorists and bad actors all over the world? And how do you balance that against privacy? Uh, these are very challenging questions. Yeah. And we are running out of time, but I we're have not going to answer them in, a, no. in a, even a few years. I mean, I think it's going to be an ongoing thing for. But wow. data security uh, and privacy is going to be a competitive advantage for companies or disadvantages if they are not respectful with that. I 100% agree with this. Yeah. And I think, you know, with customers, one of the reasons we have been able to extend into new business areas and first new product categories going way back, we just sold books and mm. then we started selling music and DVDs and electronics and toys and so on. Mm. And then we've extended in, into electronic reading with Kindle. The reason customers have been receptive, in large part, to our new initiatives is because we have worked hard to earn trust with them. Earning trust with customers is, is a valuable business asset. And if you uh, mistreat their data, they will know. They will figure it out. Customers okay. are very smart. You should never underestimate customers. People are getting hungry, but I have some brief questions left. Uh, you are preparing a second headquarter. It's going to be in the US. Why didn't you consider to do it in Europe? I wanted it in a time zone either in, we looked at Canada, okay. US, and Mexico. Um, and so it's and not we an, still, uh, Toronto is still, decision. It's, for, it's for not an anti-Europe okay, decision. I'm glad to hear that. No. When, you buy, when you bought the post, uh, there were people saying, well, that's just a personal toy. He wants to have some political influence. Yeah. Other people thought that that is a new strategic element of Jeff's strategy. Yeah. So what was it? I, yeah, of course, you can explain things to people, but you can't understand things to people. And so I can, I, I can you know, uh, all I can do is, is, is say what really my thought process was. And I was not looking to buy a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had, it had never even crossed my mind. Um, and so when the opportunity came up, uh, because I only came up because I had known Don Graham at that point for more than 15 years. Any of you who are lucky enough to know Don knows that he is the most honorable gentleman uh, that you'll ever meet. You know Don very well. Um, he's a remarkable guy. And he so loved the post that he believed, even though this was a huge personal sacrifice for him because it had been in his family for so long, that he needed to find a new home for it. Um, I think he was, I think he didn't, there were certain purchasers he was hoping would not end up yeah. buying the post um, because he wanted it to remain independent. Yeah. Um, he, when, so when he approached me uh, with this, I, I said, you know, I'm the wrong guy because I don't know anything about the newspaper business. And he said, that's okay, because we have a lot of people at the post who know a lot about the newspaper <laughs> business. And what we really need is somebody who knows something more about the internet. Um, and uh, the Post was uh, in very difficult financial position at that time. Um, and so for me, I had to decide, what, was it hopeless? And I didn't mm. believe it was hopeless. Mm. I thought I was optimistic that the Post could be turned around. Um, and then second, I had to decide, did I want to put my own time and energy into this? Um, 
uh, and, and that for me, I just had to ask the simple question, is it an important institution? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that question is yes. It was very obvious to me as soon as I thought about it that way. I was like, okay, I think I actually can help. I can help in two ways. I can provide financial resources while this turnaround occurs. And I can also help with my internet knowledge. And then is it, worth, is it an institution worth saving? You bet. It's the, it's the most important newspaper in the most important capital city in the Western world. I, I Crazy not to, not to save that newspaper. I assume they I'm going to be very happy when I'm 80 that I made that decision. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> <laughs> I, assume that, <clears throat> I assume that you have seen Steven Spielberg's film, The Post? I have. Uh, Very, yeah, I've seen it a couple of times. So what, what is the lesson that you learned from that? And could you imagine also to buy and save other newspapers? No, I, I, get, that, I get that request uh, monthly. Yeah, I, get, I, get, I, I really do. And I, and I, I yes, and I, I tell them, I, no, I'm, mm. uh, The Post is it for me. I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not interested in buying other newspapers. Um, but I do, I do, I watch that movie and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's helpful. Uh, I love that movie and also reading Catherine Graham's memoir, which won a Pulitzer Prize and is an amazing book. Um, because it, it gets me ready. You know, I, I, as the owner of the Post, I know that at times the Post is going to write stories that are going to, uh, make, very powerful people, very unhappy. And are you upset if they are writing critical stories about Amazon, which no, they do? No, no, I'm not no. upset at all. When I first bought the Post did you in ever 2013, interfere? Did you never. Call an and I never. No. I would be humiliated to interfere. Mm. I would mm. be so embarrassed. I would, I would turn bright red. And it, it has nothing to do with. Um, I don't even get so far. I just don't want to. For me, it would feel icky. It would feel gross. It would feel. It would be one of those things when I'm 80 years old. I would be so unhappy with myself yeah. if I interfered. Why would I? Yeah. I want that paper to be independent. Um, so it's in, well, we have a fantastic editor in Marty Barron. We have a fantastic publisher in Fred Ryan. The head of our technology team, a guy named Shailesh, is fantastic. They don't need my help in, in the newsroom for sure. Um, first of all, that's also an expert's job. It would be yeah. like me getting on the airplane and going up to the front of the plane and saying the pilots should move aside. Let me do this. You know, no, no, you are not getting on an airplane, a... but you are sending rockets <laughs> to the space. Yeah. Could you share with us briefly? That's the best segue ever, by the yeah. way. <laughs> Could you quick. share with us briefly the vision of uh, Blue Origin and the yeah. idea of kind of space tourism with renewable this is rockets? Super important to me. And if I. I believe on the longest time frame, and I really hear I'm thinking of a time frame of, of a couple hundred years. Um, so over many decades, I believe, and I get increasing conviction with this with every passing year, the Blue Origin, the space company, is the most important work I'm doing. Um, and so there is a whole plan uh, for Blue really? Origin. So you'd say uh, uh, retail, uh, online, uh, e-commerce, uh, yes. publishing, uh, that's all less relevant yes. than the yes. space project. Yes, and I'll tell you why. I mean, and, and so for, first of all, of course, I'm interested in space because I'm passionate about it and I've been studying it and thinking about it since I'm a five-year-old boy. But that is not why I'm pursuing this work. I'm pursuing this work because I... I believe if we don't, we will eventually end up with a civilization of stasis, which I find very demoralizing. I don't want my great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren to live in a civilization of stasis. We all enjoy a, a dynamic civilization of growth and change. And, and let's think about what powers that. We are not uh, really energy constrained. And so let me give you just a couple of numbers. If you take... Um, your body, your metabolic rate as a human, as just an animal, you eat food, that's your metabolism, you burn about 100 watts. Your power, your, your, your body is about 100, it's the same as a 100 watt light bulb. We're incredibly efficient. Your brain is about 60 watts of that. Amazing. And so, um, uh, we, if, but, you know, but if you extrapolate in developed countries where we use a lot of energy, on average, in developed countries, our civilizational metabolic rate is 11,000 watts. So our, our, if in a natural state, you know, where we're animals, we're only using 100 watts. In our actual developed world state, we're using 11,000 watts. And it's growing. 
For a century uh, or more, it's been compounding at a few percent a year, our energy usage as a civilization. Now, if you take baseline energy usage globally across the whole world and compound it at just a few percent a year for just a few hundred years, you have to cover the entire surface of the Earth in solar cells. So that's the, re that's the real energy crisis. And it's happening soon. And by soon, I mean within just a few hundred years. And so we don't actually have that much time. So what can you do? Well, you can have a life of stasis, where you cap how much energy we get to use. You have to work only on efficiency. By the way, we've always been working on energy efficiency. And still we grow our energy usage. It's not like we have been squandering energy. We have been getting better at using it with every passing decade, and still we grow it. So stasis would be very bad, I think. Now, take the alternative scenario where you move out into the solar system. The solar system can easily support a trillion humans. And if we had a trillion humans, we would have 1,000 Einsteins and 1,000 Mozarts and unlimited, for all practical purposes, resources from solar power and so on. Why not? That's, I, that's the world that I want my great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren to live in. And by the way, I believe that we will move all heavy, in that time frame, we will move all heavy industry off of Earth, and Earth will be zoned residential and light industry. And it will basically be a very beautiful planet. We have sent robotic probes to every planet in this solar system now. And believe me, this is the best one. But when can it I is not even close. But Jeff, when can I buy the first ticket to do a little space We're tour? We're going to be, so the, the, the first tourism vehicle will, uh, we, may fly, we won't be selling tickets yet, but we may put humans in it at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year. So it's very concrete. And then we're getting very close. We've been working on it for more than 10 years. And we're building a very large orbital vehicle. We've been working on that for more than five years. It'll fly for the first time in 2020. And the key is reusability. So you mentioned it. The, the, we cannot, this civilization I'm talking about of you know, getting comfortable living and working in space and having millions of people and then billions of people and then finally a trillion people in space, you can't do that with space vehicles that you use once and then throw away. It's a ridiculous, costly way to get into space. The most recent uh, thing that Amazon is planning is home robots. Yep. So I th assume I, it's more than Alexa walking. So what's the vision behind it? Which will I it saw that rumor in the press, and I it's can't comment on that. OK, I see. So it seems to be very serious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you, Jeff, you are one of the, one of the most long-term uh, thinking entrepreneurs. Uh, if it is about companies and products and services, if it is about philanthropy, you recently said that you are a very short-term thinker. You really want to deal with the now and here. Yeah. Can you explain that approach? I think that's also yeah, very and innovative. I, you know, I'll, I, I'm, and I'm going to end up doing a mixture of things. Um, we started doing, in Seattle, um, there's a homeless shelter called uh, uh, Mary's Place, run by a woman named Marty. And, um, uh, and that has really impacted my thinking on this issue. Um, because what I'm seeing is that when you, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of all the, I mean, long-term oriented philanthropy also is a good idea. So I'm not against that. It's just I'm finding I'm very motivated by the here and now there. So seeing, you know, a lot of the homelessness that Mary's Place works on is transient homelessness. So when you go study homelessness, there are a bunch of causes of homelessness. Uh, mental uh, uh, incapacity issues are a pr very hard to cure problem. Um, you know, a serious drug addiction, a very hard to cure problem. Um, but there's a, another kind, another bucket of homelessness, which is transient homelessness, which is, you know, a woman with kids, um, the father runs away, and he was the only person providing any income. And they have no support system. They have no family. That's transient homelessness. You can really help that person. Mm -hmm. And you, by the way, only need to help them for like six to nine months. You get them trained. You get them a job. They're perfectly productive members of society. 
Last week we had Bill Gates for dinner here and he said that he has a ridiculous amount of money and it's so hard <laughs> to find appropriate ways to do good with the money. Yeah. So what does money mean for you being the first person uh, in history uh, that has uh, a net worth of uh, a three digit amount of billion? The only way that I can see to uh, deploy this much financial resource is by converting my Amazon winnings into space travel. Mm. So that's basically, Blue Origin is expensive enough to be able to use that fortune. Um, and I'm currently uh, liquidating about a billion dollars a year of Amazon stock to fund Blue Origin. And um, I plan to continue to do that um, uh, for a long time. So, and you know, so, because you're, I mean, you're right, you're not gonna, you're not gonna spend it on like a second, you know, dinner out. You know, there's no, uh, it's, you're not, you know, that's not what we're talking about. So, so for me, I'm very lucky because I feel like I have a, a mission-driven purpose with Blue Origin that is, I think, incredibly important for civilization long-term. Uh, and I am gonna use my financial lottery winnings from Amazon to fund that. With regard to your personal lifestyle, there are no guilty pleasures that you are do, doing unreasonable things with. I don't money think they're that guilty. I mean, <laughs> I I, um, I have lots of pleasures, and you know, um, we just came back from an amazing uh, trip uh, with the kids. Mackenzie and I did. She planned the whole thing. It was her birthday trip, but she planned it all. We went to Norway for three days, and we stayed in an ice hotel. Um, we went dog sledding. We uh, we uh, uh, went to a wolf preserve and actually got to interact with, you know, uh, these timber wolves. I mean, it was really an incredible uh, uh, vacation, an incredible holiday, and all, we got it all done in three and a half days. So <laughs> it was really, it was amazing. Wonderful. Jeff, uh, John mentioned, that's the last uh, question, John mentioned that you are an ideal family man. Yeah? Uh, your kids are extremely important for you. You just mentioned that when we spoke earlier. If we would talk to your kids, yeah. Where would they criticize their dad? They would make fun of my singing. Oh, okay. Can we get um, a, a, no, a, God, no. No. Okay. no. Um, they would uh, uh, make fun of my inability to remember exact words. I'm always quoting like Churchill or something and getting it wrong. You know, he, he's and they're like, that's not even close to what Churchill said. Um, they would uh, they would probably depending on the moment, they might uh, uh, criticize my laugh. Um, <laughs> they're kids, you know. Uh, but but I, I, I'm lucky. I have a very good relationship with them. This work-life harmony thing is what I try to teach young employees, actually and senior executives at Amazon too, but especially the people come in. I get, we're asked about work-life balance mm -hmm. all the time. And my view is that's a debilitating phrase because it, um, it implies there's a strict trade-off. And the reality is if I'm happy at home, I come into the office with tremendous energy. And if I'm happy at work, I come home with tremendous energy. And so it actually is a circle. It's not a balance. And, um, and I think that that is, uh, is worth everybody paying attention to. You, want to have your, you never want to be that guy. And we all know, we all have a coworker who is that person who, as soon as they come into the meeting, they drain all of the energy out of the room. Mm. You can just feel the energy level go yeah. You don't want to be that guy. So you want to come into the office and give everybody a kick in their step. Jeff, we thank you very much. We, we congratulate you for all you have achieved. Thank you, Matthias. And congratulations. You're very nice. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. And